Welcome back to the jQuery Jumpstart. We are into Module 7, the last module of the day. Yay! <laughs> Cheers <laughs> from the crew back there. <laughs> so uh, to finish off the introduction to jQuery. Here we go. Start. So this module, uh, Module 7, is about libraries, jQuery and JavaScript libraries which in and of itself could take an entire week to get through them all. Uh, but we're just going to pick out a few of our favorites here and talk about them and uh, see how that goes. So we'll take a look at some jQuery libraries and then JavaScript libraries. Uh, slight difference between the two, just that there are two libraries, and those would be jQuery UI and jQuery Mobile that are specifically built on top of jQuery along with several others, but they're the two kind of official ones. And then we have JavaScript libraries. Uh, so jQuery UI, we'll start with that. And that is a nice little CSS and JavaScript library. And it's all for user interface stuff, web UI. So it just gives you a pile of assets. You get JavaScript, you get CSS, you get little widgets that are just JavaScript and HTML and CSS. Uh, also a library filled with animations, and you can do things like drag and drop and stuff like that. Uh, so it just lets you do all kind of great stuff. And then just like uh, jQuery, if you went to jQueryUI.com, you can see that they have all kind of great stuff there. Uh, if we bring up IE and just look at jQueryUI.com, same thing. Uh, the first thing you want to do when you go to jQuery UI, uh, of course, our most favorite thing, and because we're doing UI stuff, would be the themes. You can come over to here and hit the theme roller. I just love that they called it the theme roller. It's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. Um, but here are some of the things we were doing with jQuery, like the uh, animations that Jeremy was doing. Here you see there's an accordion widget uh, in the sample here in the theme roller. but. As I roll my themes, I could pick out all my color swatches and all that good stuff, and I can download it. And it's only CSS at that point, right? You just download some CSS themes. And once you have jQuery UI itself, then you can call some of the JavaScript methods to be able to uh, create an animation or work with any of the UI elements. Um, another thing you could do is, again, out of Visual Studio, uh, you could just go into NuGet your NuGet packages. You can look online to see what kind of jQuery stuff is there. And I could go to jQuery UI, and that should pop up in here somewhere as well, right? Eventually, there we see some jQuery UI. You might see multiple ones in here as well. Uh, also, with jQuery UI, since it's user interface, uh, we get a lot of nice little things with it, like being able to do those animations or drag and drop and things like that. Uh, a lot of folks are going towards some other libraries as well. This has been around like just after jQuery came out to help us out uh, to be able to build nice, robust user interfaces. Um, here's a list of all the cool little widget things that they have. You can just go to the widgets section of the jQuery UI site and you'll see all of this. These are all really popular kind of controls or widgets, uh, like the date picker, that's a big one. That's Nobody wants to have to write that themselves, so you get that. Um, menus, uh, I'm really not a fan of drop down menus, but if you have a little bit of JavaScript that interacts with the menu, uh, if it's a classic drop down menu, those are fortunately going away, because um, that's another accessibility issue. And a lot of people who, uh, don't even necessarily have accessibility needs, have a hard time with JavaScript drop-down menu. I hate those things. Don't you hate those things? Yeah. Yeah, they're just very annoying. Um, but there's a menu that you could use just to, to have a menu. Uh, the progress bar, progress wheel, spinny wheel, that's kind of important. Uh, sliders and tabs and all that good stuff. Uh, jQuery Mobile is another really good uh, library from JavaScript. Uh, so this again has CSS and JavaScript, but it's specific to mobile web development. So that means it's touch optimized because that's what people are using on phones and tablets. Right? So it does all the touch stuff. And Jeremy mentioned the pointer events before. So all that stuff is wrapped up into jQuery UI. Uh, so you don't have to worry about doing things like 
um, working between using touch or uh, a non-touch like a pen or a pointing device. jQuery mobile, as well as any really anything in jQuery, uses the data attributes. And Jeremy showed one of these before. So what you do is you'd set up jQuery mobile uh, and you would use these attributes to apply pieces of jQuery mobile to your website and to be able to style it a certain way. So that's really cool that we can do that. Uh, and also, again, the themes, right? So a lot of good stuff with uh, jQuery mobile. Okay. Um, as far as JavaScript libraries go, what do you have? Is what are you using? You know, I want to I want to show off uh, a few th that I like. Okay. There's one site that I go to quite a bit. Actually, if you go to my um, my blog, and I believe it is JS Libraries. I believe it is JS Libraries. Okay. And I believe that my blog is slow right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll show you a different one first then. There's one called uh, microjs.com. And microjs is a massive list of little tiny libraries. These are all, you'll notice that the sizes of these, they don't even get over like 3 or 4K. They're all super small. There's a 5K one. And, and each of these uh, offers some, you know, big value for you. This is a human-friendly alternative to the HSL color space. And so you go get this library and bring in this very small dependency into your application, and then all of a sudden you have this huge functionality in managing colors and working with colors. So this is a really great one. I usually come here and search for something like, like let's say I want to implement promises. Look at that there's pledges. Look at the 19 matches in this list nice. just for... Promises. promises. There's pledges. There's pinky swear, promiscuous, D, promise. I know there's one called Q. <laughs> there's there's just tons of promise libraries, and so this is a good place to come and look for libraries. I also really like um, this one library called D3JS.org. If you want to make data-driven documents, this is a really cool way to do it. If you have, especially combined with big data, I think some of the stuff that comes out of this can just really blow your mind. Um, the, the kinds of uh, visuals that it comes up with or that they come up with and that they have in the examples for you to start with are just really inspiring. So I, I went and grabbed a few of them, a few of my favorites, and uh, I'm going to try to show those to you. So here's one where it's just showing some spinning circles. Now this, this is a cool graphic. You're like, oh yeah, I've seen stuff that cool before. But um, the, the cool thing about this is that this might be um, the size of these sectors of this circle might be dependent upon the, the data that's coming back from a web service. So there can be some meaning to this, and that's kind of the whole point behind D3, behind the data-driven documents. Here's one that visualizes soccer passes in a game. And so you can hover on any of these uh, players, and it, and it visualizes, it shows you where the soccer passes were. Here's one that just visualizes a, uh, a triangle on the uh, uh, unit circle. Uh, this one's pretty neat. It's a relationship between a lot of things. And when you hover over them, it just highlights the lines in between them. And I just thought that worked really cool. This one is interactive. I can actually grab these points and drag them around, pull them around. You can see that the performance is really good um, in here. And D3 does not confine you to using anything like Canvas or SVG. or You can just kind of use whatever you want to, it's just a, it's just a great language for turning data into a, a visual. This one's kind of neat. It responds to my mouse and everything moves around. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's, oh, and then, yeah, this is my, my blog that I was telling you about. I list MicroJS. Scott Hanselman has a really good post with a number of JavaScript libraries. There's a good list on Wikipedia, and then here's another list that I found really helpful. So if you can just remember codefoster.com slash JS libraries, that might be an index for you. I tend to try to create things like that on my blog, such as the uh, media um, uh, post where I have a list of a whole bunch of free and some not free um, uh, media images, audio, video resources that anybody can use. So anyway, that's kind of an aside. So that's, that's mine, D3. It's my favorite. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I like that one. Uh, also, if you're doing, uh, since you said three, that <laughs> reminded me of 3JS, which oh. is, yeah, that's whiz bang. Yeah. So if you're doing like really fancy 3D graphics and whatnot, uh, 3JS is really good. As a matter of fact, we did a um, little sample um, with the IE team where we used 3JS to do um, Assassin's Creed, the pirate ship, to navigate it through waters. It's pretty cool if you go to modern.ie website, you could find that through there somewhere. Uh, so that's a, another great library. Uh, I like the small libraries too. So we have things like Moment.js, which is really easy to work with dates and things like that. Uh, so you could just have a lot of functions and whatnot for dates, which are always a pain in the butt, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, totally. Uh, they're just terrible for a lot of people to work with. So that just wraps all of that stuff up for you. What kinds, of, uh, what kinds of functionality does it give you for dates? Uh, pretty much everything. Any way to slice and dice dates in a, like, a reasonable manner where you wouldn't have to write all your own functions to yeah. pull it apart and to parse it and do all that, it's that library that you probably would have wrote yourself or maybe already have have libraries like that. The ditch it, and use this one. I, I, that's what I do. I, it's more I, tested. Exactly. Yeah, nobody's, I could, I suppose, like put my stuff out there, but you know, somebody else put moment out there and I'm like, well, hey, I'll you know, use that because you know I'm lazy and I would actually have to maintain my own code. And, <laughs> who wants to do that? Who wants to do that? You know what you should also take a look at? Let's look at my screen at date.js. Date.js oh, is date similar. Is have you good used too. it? Yeah, it's, it's very similar to moment. Yeah, it's super cool. It allows you to type things like, uh, the day after tomorrow or, or uh, tomorrow morning at 8 and, you know, things like that. And it turns that into an actual date that you actual can work date. with. That's yeah, pretty fun. Yeah, almost like Cortana. Yeah, stuff right. Stuff like that, yeah. right? The cool thing is that when you find libraries like this, date and moment, you don't have to choose between them. You know, oftentimes, oftentimes these days, we, uh, we don't have to be too concerned with the size of the libraries that we use. Now, if we're starting with mobile and considering mobile, we might want to think about that. But sometimes we can, we can take both of those dependencies. That's true. And stuff like that, they're small. Yeah. Right? Right. Those, those are really small libraries. It's when you have those libraries and then you have, like, the bigger frameworks and you, you know, start taking all of those dependencies. Uh, a, dependency management becomes an issue because they all have versions right, that you have to watch out, and some may conflict with versions of other JavaScript libraries, uh, things like that. So those are all considerations as yeah, well. Yeah, right. right. So uh, before we go on more with the JavaScript libraries, uh, just for the Visual Studio users, um, just to show you where another way to get it in Visual Studio, outside of NuGet, if we go back to, say, jQuery Mobile uh, and jQuery UI, jQuery UI, you could just simply go through NuGet. However, if you have jQuery Mobile and you open up uh, Visual Studio 2013 uh, or 2012, it's in 2012, but if you go into 2013, under your web node, you'll notice this little Visual Studio 2012 node that's right in here. And that has some of the, the slightly older templates, mm -hmm. but they're not bad at all. And you have the MVC4 web application. Uh, so when I create an application there, one of my options is create a mobile application. So if I choose the mobile application, what that's going to do is that's going to put jQuery mobile in to do a mobile first site. Um, now, I didn't mention it doing this in 2013 all by itself. We had to go back to MVC4. So what happens is in 2013, we have the extra um, library of not in addition to jQuery Mobile, but uh, as a different library for MVC5, when we do a new project, we don't even have to pick out mobile. It is mobile first, but what it does is it creates references instead to bootstrap. So here's a little bit where I'm torn. I like jQuery Mobile, but I like bootstrap. <laughs> bootstrap is a little shinier. <laughs> and uh, jQuery Mobile actually has a very, um, non-Microsoft look and feel to it, mm -hmm. right? That other company, it kind of looks like their products, mm -hmm. right? Am I allowed to say them? Yeah. <laughs> right. So others. others. Um, so, and, and that's a perfectly fine look, right? And it works and it's all very mobilized and responsive. Uh, however, Bootstrap gives you a little bit more options when it comes to stuff like that. So the CSS, I think, is just a little more modern and the JavaScript's a little more modern. 
but they both give you at least a base of the same kind of functionality. Mobile first, touch enabled, works great on small devices, and it's responsive. Uh, so those are some of the important things. And then you'll notice here in Visual Studio, uh, regardless of which one I'm in, you'll still see references to jQuery in here. So I have all of my jQuery references, even though I'm working uh, in this one in Visual Studio 2013 uh, with Bootstrap, including the jQuery Validate. And here we have Respond as well, which is another great library uh, to use. Uh, if I pop back over to the jQuery mobile site, here we'll see pretty similar. It's the same kind of setup. But instead of Bootstrap, we have jQuery and then jQuery Mobile in here, hmm. uh, right? And then if you run them, if you just take a look, jQuery Mobile, once this pops up, uh, if I squish this up a little bit, boy, that looks you're suspiciously like the other company, right? Um, and then, of course, Bootstrap. And you notice the responsive design there, right? So as I squish that up, you see that it's changing. If I come back over here into the Bootstrap template, and you can see here the same thing. It'll start out uh, a little bit more squished up. And then as I change the form factor around, you can see the menus change and all that good stuff. And uh, Bootstrap has a lot of nice things for that. So either way, if you're a developer using Visual Studio, you get jQuery Mobile or Bootstrap, right? depending on which version or either or. It doesn't really matter. You know, one doesn't have to go with MVC4 and the other doesn't have to go with MVC5. Uh, but you could have your pick of the litter right, yeah. for either of those. <laughs> right, and they're both very, very good libraries. Right. Uh, so let's see, other libraries that we have? What is, oh, you use any of these? Uh, let's see. I used uh, just gauge on a little thing a while back. I it, don't regularly use any of those. What um, is just gauge? So it's just a gauge. <laughs> Literally, that's all that it is. So uh, just when you have a little dashboard, it reminds me of the like the Fitbit dashboard for anybody who has that, okay. right? Um, little like a kind of like a gas gauge on your car. Okay. All right. Uh, so it looks like that, and that's just handy. So you just give it a starting and an ending point, and then whoop, just tell the gauge where to go. It's like uh, yeah, moments for dates. Uh, Complexify helps us manage some JSON and things like that. YUI is popular. Uh, I don't really use YUI a lot. That and Moo tools, but they yeah. are very, very and prototype popular. Prototype is popular too. Prototype's also popular. Uh, prototype tries to do a bit of what jQuery does, but it did it before. That's been around actually even before jQuery. Yeah. So, uh, as a very popular tool. And then there's about what five thousand other tools and libraries <laughs> out there. Literally, if you go into NuGet and you just start looking for JavaScript frameworks, you're going to find one to do pretty much anything you need. Uh, I can't imagine that there's anything that's not covered at this point as far as a library that's out there and that's open source that you can get. Um, there are some that are paid for as well, right? We have many vendors that work uh, partners with Microsoft, and you can, you know, get theirs and pay for theirs. But these are all uh, open source, right? uh, which, oh, you know, it's good. It's free, right? And uh, we get to contribute if we need to with open source. Uh, so any other JavaScript libraries that you like? None that are coming to mind. Boy, there's just so many out there. I, I love coming across them. And of course, they all have to have some sort of a quirky name yeah. in order to be a valid JavaScript library. It seems that way. Yeah, like Bootstrap, right? You know, there were some questions in the chat room around the positioning of some of these, not, not the little scrappy libraries that, that fill one function, but these big libraries that everybody's heard of. I'm talking about jQuery and Angular, mm -hmm. and actually the question in the chat room was trying to, um, they were trying to position the concept of Ajax with those. And so I thought we'd just spend just a, a second talking about where these things all fit. Yeah. This entire course has been about jQuery, which we would call a utility library. It's for, it's for making the things that you would otherwise just do right there in JavaScript a little easier than writing the JavaScript. Um, the Angular JS is a library that's really increasing in popularity these days, so you'll hear a lot about it. It would really behoove you to um, at least get yourself up to 100 level in Angular, just so mm -hmm. you understand where it's at. Um, if not, just dive right in and start and start figuring out how to use that. It's a really a, a good 
good one to use, but it's very different from jQuery, extremely yes. different. jQuery is a utility library. Angular is more of a framework, okay? So you don't, you take a dependency, if you take a dependency on jQuery, in order to pull it out, you would have to go through and change a bunch of calls to, to doing them the native way. If you took a dependency on Angular, boy, you'd have a hard time pulling it out <laughs> because yes, your whole yes. application is sitting on it. It's dependent on it, okay? And it's, it's creating concepts like controllers and views that allow you to create a pattern that uh, we like to affectionately call MV star because it's hard to say whether it's MVC, MVP, MVVM, you know, it's, it's hard to say. And so it's an MV star pattern. And this pattern is really great for as your application grows because it allows you to create these, these um, code objects, we call them view models, that are based on all your data, all your models. You've, if, you're, if you're a hospital application, you have nurses and patients and doctors and medicine and all these entities that are in your domain. And, and you take those and you turn them into these view models and then those view models feed your views. And it makes, it makes it really conceptually easy for you. And it also makes it much easier for you to create a test suite that actually tests those view models and makes sure that they are what they're supposed to be. And it also allows you, because you have that level of abstraction, that layer of abstraction, it allows you to, say, create two different views that are both, both based on the same view model. And maybe the user gets to opt for one or the other, and you don't have a lot of code to write one or the other because they're both just views. They're both just looking at the same data. And when it comes time to write your application in a different environment with a completely different UI, it's pretty easy to do because you've got these view models that are all of the data that's supposed to show up on the screen. All you have to do is define how it shows up and what it looks like. So that's, uh, that's the big difference between jQuery and something like Angular. FYI, Angular being a framework application, its peers would kind of be things like Ember. Ember. Backbone. Backbone. Yeah. Um, possibly Knockout, although that's a little bit trim, a little, a bit, little bit more trim, a little bit yeah. more narrow. Uh, but Knockout's a very popular data binding uh, framework yeah. that we would have. Durandal is, is one that one. can, it's again kind of narrow, but. Yeah. yeah, so there are frameworks also. So we go from those little utility libraries, like you mentioned, to full on frameworks. And these can get really big, even in size. Uh, some of them allow you to pick what you want out of them, which if you have that option, do it. <laughs> because if not, you're just pulling down stuff you don't need and then you're sending that to the user. You don't want that. Right. Like in the latest version of WinJS, you don't have to use the whole WinJS library. You can go use the AMD module pattern and say, I'm interested in this piece, this piece, and this piece, and that's the only thing that's ever loaded into your code. So that's great and, for mobile. And what's funny about the WinJS model is that usually, like, WinJS, everything's already uh, locally. Like oh, yeah. That anyway. yeah. <laughs> so, well, but not, not anymore because WinJS is now. on the web. Too. Oh, that's true. That's on, it's on the web now. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, you can just go to try.buildwinjs.com and you see, it, see it running in the browser, whatever browser you have. Okay, so can you, for the crowd, can you position Ajax? It's not a library. Can you tell them what the difference is between Ajax and all these libraries we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so Ajax is more of a thing than a library. <laughs> yeah, it's just a thing. That clears up everything, right? Uh, so Ajax is kind of a, a way or a technique to get data, right? Like we said before, asynchronous JavaScript and JSON is what it should really be. Um, Ajax. But yeah, Ajax. Yeah, that doesn't roll off the tongue very well. So that is just simply being able to get that data, that JSON, or you can actually get XML if you really want to. You could get XML data as well, um, but that's what that is for. And usually you can use Ajax in something like Angular or with any of these libraries. Uh, so Ajax is just your means of obtaining that data, and then we bind it up with Knockout, or we put it into a view model and consume it in Angular and bind it there or something like that. Yeah. I, in my mind, I like to think of Ajax as like the use of the XML HTTP request object. Yes. Because there's this well, object. that's actually what it is. Yeah, 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 that's right. There's this object in your browser that is like a little browser itself. Like when you go to your browser, you go type something in the top and it does a request and it comes back with a response. And if you want to go to a new place, you do that again. Well, when you go to a, a site, you do a request, you do a response, and then you stay there, your browser stays there, 
and AJAX is the mean by which, programmatically, you can tell this XHR object, this XML HTTP request object, would you go do a request for me, pull back a response, and then tell it to me? And I'm going to use that to feed or append or amend this document that I'm currently looking at. It's really a nice experience for the user because yeah. nothing moves. It just, just shows up. It's really a request and the user doesn't, it's a sneaky request. A sneaky is request, what it is. Yeah. It's a little sneaky HTTP request. That's the way I'm going to use, that's what, the way I'm going to define it from now on. It's a sneaky request. Stealth request. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, that covers I libraries. That's libraries. Uh, I like to check near the end of the day and see if there's any, uh, any chat room uh, chatter that we can answer. Um, but we are right near the end anyway, and I'm not seeing my chat room. I'm going to wait for somebody to ask about that obscure library that none of us have ever heard of. Oh, yeah, they're going to say, have you ever heard of it? only thousands of them. You mean you're not aware of all of the libraries? Maybe not. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you to vote. That would be really, really helpful for us. There is a poll, and uh, it's, it's awesome for us if you guys don't mind going and doing a vote there. It's really helpful. Oh, somebody asked about Node.js. Why don't you talk about that? Well, oh, Node. I totally great question. forgot about Node. Yeah. yeah, so Node. Unlike everything that we talked about so far, Node, if, if you asked me if this was going to happen like 10 years ago, I would have... I'm laughing now just thinking about it. Uh, I would have been laughing. Saying JavaScript on the server. All of this has been JavaScript on the client. Node is JavaScript on the server. Uh, actually, I think that's pretty awesome now. Although years ago, I would have been like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, but, you know, years ago, the environment and the way we did development it wasn't exactly like it is now. And we didn't have things like NoSQL that Node tends to... Um, work very well with. So Node.js is a way to be able to write JavaScript and do it on the server and manage data on the server. And if you have Azure, Node.js just runs perfectly in there. So that's uh, great there. I, I should also mention that um, if you like Node, get the Node.js tools for Visual Studio. Mm, yeah. It really lights up Visual Studio with the ability to kind of recognize Node as a, a first class project type. It actually is running Node behind it, so it's kind of live. And then you can deploy it to Azure like lickety split. Yeah. I think that's officially officially the, the term. Officially the lickety term, split. lickety split. And then there's another package that you can get for Visual Studio. You have to be running uh, a stable release because if you're running the... Who um, does that? Yeah, who runs a stable release? I, I, I have update 4, which is like in RC or something, for Visual Studio 2013, and I've also been using Visual Studio 2014 for a while, or Visual Studio 14, and in both of those you can't install these. So if you have a stable release, you can also get the Task Runner Explorer. Just go to Node, uh, sorry, Nougat, the candy store, and search for the Task Runner Explorer, and that lights up Visual Studio with NPM and Bower and Grunt and the ability to manage that whole means for right. doing and DevOps and JavaScript. PM is the Node Package Manager, kind of like NuGet. And then uh, Grunt is a helper library. It's a task yeah, runner, kind of like runner. MS Build. Yep. yep. And then I think there's actually one thing we forgot um, as far as JavaScript libraries. When you said test runner, it reminded me. Uh, there's something called QUnit. Right. Oh, QUnit, so yeah. for if you're going to do unit testing in JavaScript, uh, so you could use that with jQuery and things like that too. QUnit, Jasmine, QUnit. Mocha. Yep. So there's a lot of unit testing JavaScript yeah. libraries out there as well. Yeah. And JavaScript testing, in my opinion, is just a little bit more difficult inherently than it is in more strongly typed languages, and you're more dependent on a good convention and a, and a good structure for all your unit tests. And right. so I would definitely take the time to go um, watch some videos by some really smart people on JavaScript testing before you get into it. Uh, that, yeah, and if you're going to do that, you're probably going to use a framework like Angular or at least binding like yeah. Knockout or something like that. You're yeah. probably not just going to do testing in jQuery. You're probably going to have some of those other heavy hitting libraries in there too. Uh, can I use promises without using jQuery or any other library? Not currently, um, although the plan is for all of the browsers to implement promises in the... ECMAScript 6. In ECMAScript 6, yep. So it will be in there, but currently it's not. If you want the lightest library, 
Um, I, I recommend Q. I think that Q.js is, yeah. is the best library. That all it does is promises. It's a really good pattern. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah, and if you're doing WinJS development, that's built in. It's right? built but into WinJS, yeah. WinJS, but uh, otherwise ES6. Yeah, great. Well, man, that's uh, that's cool. Um, uh, somebody said the names of the J JavaScript testing tools. Once again, QUnit, Jasmine, Mocha. Uh, I don't remember any more off the top of my head, but there are at least a couple more of the bigger ones. But. Yep. Okay, well, I think that's probably it for introduction to jQuery. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Seven modules. I think we got a lot of information relayed. The camera guys are all thrilled because they're ready to go home. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Time for yeah, but it's been really fun. Thank you for joining me, Rachel. Thanks, Jeremy. Good. And thank you all, and we will see you next time on Microsoft Virtual Academy.